Hello and welcome to the Board Breakdown Podcast with Johnny, Tom, Matt and our guests for today. Players who played over 315 appearances in league football across Huddersfield, where he's the club captain in their first pre- uh, first season in the Premier League, uh, Stork and at the Borough. And um, it's Borough right back, Tommy Smith. Tommy, um, thanks so much for joining us firstly. Um, but how was the recovery going? You got any more time skills for us? Uh, are, you, are you starting to get back to, to full, full, full fitness? Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I really appreciate you having me on. Um, yeah, listen, the injuries, um, it's, it's been a tough one. It's, it's certainly uh, hit me hard in terms of, in terms of the time frame of, of how long I've been out for and how long I'm going to be out for. That, that's been difficult to sort of adapt to. Um, I think in terms of time frames, I, I don't, I'm not sure that the guys and myself really want to put an exact time frame on what time I want to be back. But I'd like to think I've, I've sort of broke the back of it now in terms of the injury. I've done, I've done six months now it's coming up to, which has felt like an absolute lifetime. It's been, um, it has been tough. And, you know, I've been very fortunate in my, in my career that I've, that I've not had many injuries, certainly not any long-term ones. Um, this, this has been, you know, by far and away the, the, the hardest part of my career that I've, that I've endured. Absolutely. Um, you know, as I said, I've done six months. I'm hopeful, very, very hopeful that I will be in and around it come pre-season. But in terms of an exact time frame, I'm still a little bit unsure on that. Just taking it a day as it comes at the minute. Yeah, like obviously with with injuries like this, have you found like you've picked up like any random hobbies to kind of keep yourself occupied? Well, I've I've had to I've had to do things in a, in in a very structured routine because one thing yeah. I do need in my life is routine. And I found mm. it very, very difficult at the start of my injury to, to get that sort of routine because yeah. I was off my feet. I had crutches. I was in a walking boot. Um, I was driving myself around the bend. I mean, you only have to ask my mm. wife. I, I was hard to be around. And I know that it was it was a difficult time for me to sort of gain any sort of routine in, in my life. Um, I've got my two girls at home, got two daughters at home, which which helped me keep sane, really, because they're on the go all the time and, you know, that sort of stuff. So in terms of hobbies, probably not, no. I mean, the, the biggest thing I could say I had was was just being a dad, which mm. which was which was nice. It was something that you don't really get a chance to be really in, when, you, when you're in the football industry because of how relentless and how sort of, um, you know, difficult it is being a footballer in terms of the schedule and, and, the, and the amount of games you have to play. So being a dad for me was, was, was obviously nice. I was at home for best part of two months really um, because I was so unable to do anything when I, when I first had the injury. So that was obviously nice being at home and, be, and being a full-time dad for them two months. Yeah, like you, you've said though, um, like just just then, if you don't mind going back to it, but you said like it's been probably the most difficult part of your career. Like, what's what's it like for someone who's when like a footballer who's like had this like long term injury? Like, why why is it becoming like, so difficult? Is it just because you can't do the do the thing that you love? Yeah, but like I've just touched on there about routine. Yeah. I think one thing that mm-hmm. we we have as footballers that that we that we crave. I think if you ask the majority of footballers, they probably say the same thing: is structure and routine. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm 31 now. I've been playing professionally since I was 20. So that's 11 years of sort of, you know, routine, 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 routine. And you get accustomed to it. You know, the, the ins and outs of it. Listen, I, I, I know I know better than anyone that, you know, we, we, we're spoiled as footballers in terms of what we get and how we get it. And everything's sort of laid on a plate for us, whether it be your breakfast or your pre-match meal or the, the kit that you get, anything like that. You know, we're very lucky to, to have the job that we have. Um and we do get spoiled in terms of our routine and our structure. And when we come away from that, like I have done because of this injury, you sort of lose your way a little bit and you're sort of thinking, mm. how do I keep that routine and keep that structure in your life? Um, and that's that's the bit I found difficult um, the first couple of months. Slowly, slowly, as, as the time's been going on, I've been getting that back in terms of my rehab and in terms of what I'm doing in the gym and this, that and the other. Um, so I am getting that back a little bit now, which which I definitely feel better for. Oh, okay, um, I was just gonna go on to the the next bit, um, kind of moving away from present day stuff, uh, going back to the start of your career, um, getting into academy academy football and working your way up. How was it you initially got spotted for that? Just to kind of lighten the mood a little bit after all the injury talk. <laughs> yeah, it's quite it's quite depressing talking about the injury <laughs> stuff, isn't it? Yeah, believe you me, it's not it's not nice talking about it. Um, but no, when, when I first started, I, I think um, I always played from from a young age locally. Um, I was spotted playing for my local team by Tranmere Rovers. That was probably age seven. Um, I'd done four years at Tranmere and again got spotted 
at 11 uh, by Man City. And I went to Man City Academy from there. And that's where I sort of progressed through the age groups right the way through uh, to, to, to being a reserve team player at Man City. This was this was long before the Man City bit that, that everyone's accustomed to now. Um, Platt Lane was where was where we used to train in, in Moss Side, the middle of Moss Side. I don't know whether you guys have, have ever heard of that. Um, yeah, completely different sort of uh, training ground and and football club to, to the one that everyone sees now. But I loved it at Man City when, when I was there. Um, the, you know, the facilities were, were what I thought was amazing. The, the training ground, the staff, the players. I just loved everything about the football club then. Um, you know, didn't really foresee what was going to be the Man City of today. But from, what, from the time I was there, I absolutely loved it. Go, starting to go through the academy there, how does that kind of affect the social aspects of your life? Because you mentioned earlier about having that set routine. Is that where it's kind of drilled into you, uh, so to speak? Absolutely, yeah. Listen, I, I think it's all I've ever known, football. Um, you know, I'm not afraid to say that. Without football, I have no idea what I would be doing or where I would be. Um, it completely takes over your life, but I believe it's definitely for the better. You know, that some of the memories I've got and some of the things that I've achieved and done and uh, been able to do, you know, it, it's it's made my life what it is today. It's, you know, I've, I've loved every single minute of it. And again, like I've just said about the routine element of it, you, you do definitely get that drilled into you at an early age, but I think it's what you need. And I think it's certainly what I've, I've benefited from having that routine and that sort of structure in my life. Um, because as I say, I think without it, you, you never know where you're going to end up. Um, it's definitely, being at Man City for, the, for all them years, I've definitely learned obviously football skills, but I also learned life skills as well, which have set me up to, to, to get to the age I am today and, and have that sort of them life experiences that, that, I've, that I've had from, from being there at Man City at such a young age. And, you know, getting through the academy and, and getting your first pro deal, how do you, how do you celebrate that when, when you get to that point? Do you know what? Honestly, I mean, it seems like a lifetime ago now. I don't even think it was a sort of celebration. I think one thing that I always had from from my parents, from my mum and dad, was you have to stay sort of humble with it and stay grounded because I've, I mean, I've seen. I can look back now and say that I've seen over the years so many players who were so good and they just got too ahead of themselves and ended up becoming nothing. Um, and it's one thing that I think my mum and dad were great with. And they they sort of always told me to to you always have to have want more and have to have more. You can't ever be satisfied with with what you've got. So whether that be my first YTS contract or my first pro contract or um, my first big contract at Huddersfield or moving to Stoke, it was always a case of what's next, what's next, and that's that's always sort of stuck with me and been drilled into me from a young age. Whereas, you know, it was never a case of getting a deal and thinking, yes, I've I've made it now or I've cracked it or I've done it. It was always sort of right. That's that's been put to bed now. That's parked up. What's next? You joined Helsby, I believe, after you uh, were released from City and you achieved promotion to the West Cheshire League Division 2. What was it like in regards to academy football versus non-league football versus professional football? Hey, Would that's, you say that's some, that's some bit the biggest differences? That. Yeah, well, I, that's <laughs> I, the research. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't even tell you that, and I played. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so what I've done is when I, when I left Man City, um, so my contract ran to June as most contracts do and I left Man City in January because my idea was that I wanted to leave in January and sort of get a little bit of time before the end of the season where I could go and get match fit because ultimately I wasn't in a position where I was ready to play so I left in the January um, the January window closed and for whatever reason I, I had a friend um, and my dad was connected with with Hellsby Football Club and um, they just said listen why don't you come and play for us till the end of the season keep yourself match fit Um and then come pre-season, you're ready to go for wherever you go. And I thought, you know what, it's, that's not for me that I don't want to go and play with, you know, some of the pitches, were, they, they weren't the best. Um, and I was thinking to myself, I could go and get injured or whatever. And anyway, he convinced me to do it. And I just thought, you know what, I'll go and play. It was down the road. Um, and I, for, honestly, for three, four months, I absolutely loved it. It was like, I mean, I was 21 years of age at the time. The 20, 20 years of age at the time. Um, and I just loved it. It gave me that feeling of... Um, you know, playing with your mates down the park again, that sort of feeling that I hadn't had for such a long time because obviously when, you, when you're contracted to, to a football club, you don't get them allowances anymore. You can't really play locally with, you, with your mates because you, you're worried about injuries and this, that and the other. And I went and played and I only played about nine or ten games. But again, the sort of freedom that I had to play with my mates and, 
and knowing that there wasn't like that sort of immediate pressure of you know league table and relegation and this and that and I just sort of played with it with a with a freedom and as I say absolutely loved it really really loved it playing with my friends and afterwards going into the, the the local sort of pub and just having a drink and it was just it was completely different to, to that sort of um professional you know competitive ruthlessness that, that you experienced um of playing of playing week 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 to week that's a fantastic story i love that i love seeing and hearing the journey of the differences between different levels of football um, you did find yourself moving back to the football league with Huddersfield and you were promoted to the first team and you spent six years there, including a promotion campaign. Um, you played in the final, I think you played 88 minutes. And I just want to know what that was like for you at Huddersfield and, and was that particular period a real highlight of your career? I think it'd have to be the biggest the biggest highlight of my career by an absolute country mile. Um that season itself was 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 such a special season. I mean, I'd, I'd been at Huddersfield, as you touched on there, I'd, I'd been at Huddersfield for six, I think that'd be seven, six, seven years, whatever it was. And when I joined Huddersfield, they they just weren't the club um, that you would ever sort of see being in that that category. They, they just wasn't, you know, I've got no shame in saying that. When when I joined Huddersfield, we were, um, we were very much a team that was sort of bottom half, you know, if you can get into that top half, it'd, it'd be seen as a big success. Um, and, and we had that for a few years. You know, we had a, we had a decent team. But when, I, when I first broke into the team, there was some some very good players in that team, but it just wasn't on the level of some of the other teams in the championship. Um, you know, Huddersfield knew what they were. They were, they were a hard-working team. We, had, um, we didn't have the biggest wage bill. We didn't have the biggest transfer budget. But... Since the the manager David Wagner come in, the German manager come in. Currently, he's at Norwich now. Um, he he just sort of changed the whole perception of of the football club. Um, he, he 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 tweaked certain things in terms of how how the um, how he wanted us to be as a club. And that that season that he had his first full season in charge was the season we got promoted. And I look back at it now, and I just think to myself, the way he, the way he done things, he, he was he was a genius. He was honestly. Uh, because at the time when you're living it and you're experiencing it, you don't really look that much into it. You just do it. Um, but looking back at it now, it was absolutely incredible how we how we how we put us on the on the map, if you like. As not only a club we were were, were fighting relegation, that were a club that were like top sixteen. Because that season we got promoted, we were we we were we were really really good. We were a good we were a good side to watch. We we won football matches. We won in different ways. Um, and I think come the end of the season, I don't think anyone could really argue with us actually being promoted. I think we spent the majority of that season, I would say 75% of that season, we, we spent in the top three or four, if I can remember rightly. Um, so it wasn't by fluke that season. It certainly wasn't by fluke. Um, and then to finish it off at Wembley like we did um, on a penalty shootout, it's just beyond your wildest dreams. Um, what, what a day that was. Such a special day. Yeah, talk to me about that, by the way. Like, what was it like when that penalty went in, and you just knew that it was, it was it, Premier League? It was such a weird feeling because I had I had all sorts going on it, on that day. I mean, first of all, I led the team out, which again, mm. I've got I've got pictures around my house of of sort of uh, being leading the team out at Wembley, and you can sort of see I'm I'm walking out, and you can see this sort of crowd behind. And again, when you're there on the day, you don't even let it sink in. It's it's quite it's quite crazy, really, to think I. I don't really remember a lot from the day because when you're playing, it doesn't matter what stadium you're in or how many people are there. All you're doing is you're just thinking about the game. It's only when mm. you look back now at pictures, I've, I say I've got pictures in my house of, of, of coming out before the game, uh, the pre-match handshake with the referees and all that sort of stuff. And you actually can see behind, obviously the ground and it's full. And you, I look back mm. now and I think, God, how did I not let that sink in at the time? You know, mm. um, so we had the game, terrible game, ended up nil-nil. Really, really poor game for a neutral, <laughs> honest to God. Um, and, I, and I obviously go off injured. So I end up watching the extra time and the penalties on crutches in a, in a, in a moon boot. So all these emotions have gone through my head thinking, oh my God, I've not even been able to finish the game. Um, you know, what if this happens? What if that happens? The, and when we score the winning penalty, I'm sort of on the floor in tears I, I can't really run off anywhere because I've got a boot on I've got crutches on it was just it was just madness it was just complete madness but 
Um, yeah, what a day. What a day. I wouldn't, wouldn't change it at all because, you know, I think to myself, if I was fit, would I have took a penalty? Could I have missed? Would we have lost? You know, all that sort of stuff. So the way it worked out, even though I got injured, it was fine by me because it was just an unbelievable day. Do you think you would have took one? Do you took one? Um, no, so I wouldn't have been in the first five. That, that's just that's just it was never the case. But yeah. so the semi final before, quick story about the semi final before, I was actually due to take the next penalty. So Forrest the Airy for Sheffield Wednesday took the penalty, and if he'd have scored, I'd have been next. Thankfully, oh, no. he obviously missed, so it saved me a <laughs> saved me a penalty really. Um, so yeah, but again, even in the final, we we didn't get past the five penalty takers, so I wouldn't have took one. Thankfully. It's not- I'm <laughs> not a fan of taking them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've not really. Do you know what? In my whole career, I've taken two penalties. I think both of them are in shootouts in cup games. Other than that, I've I've never taken one. Not for me. Not for me. Either. No, I can't say why. <laughs> <laughs> me neither. <laughs> Is it funny? Do you know what I always think as well? I always think to myself, if you had a free shot from 12 yards in a game situation, no one was around you, you'd back yourself every time, wouldn't you? 100%. As soon as it's put, as soon as it's putting the ball down on a spot and it's penalty, it's almost like that. Yeah. It just goes out the window, and you just—it's madness. I've always thought yeah. that the pressure just I'm, comes I'm, from absolutely nowhere, doesn't it? It's crazy. Oh, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I missed I one in a works game a couple of years ago. It still haunts me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what the worst thing is right? Do you know before the final, uh, and we done it uh, with Middlesbrough last year when we uh, before the semis because obviously you got to prepare for him. Mm. Most penalties I take in training. I feel fine. Like, I've, I've got no problem. Mm. And you, and as soon as you get to a game situation, it, it's almost like you just you, you sort of lose your way a little bit. Fair play to the lads who do it because I tell you what, you know, but them, them them penalties at Wembley, I was nervous stood watching them. So fair play yeah. to the lads who. I mean, we. I think we um, did. We miss one or we missed two. Uh, oh, I can't remember now off the top of my head, but the lad, the lads who come on and, and they just sticking them in, and and even the last one from uh, Chris Schindler was the boy who scored the winning penalty. I'll tell you what, it takes some bottle, so fair play. I was going to say, like you just sorry, Tom. I was going to say, like you said earlier on, like you don't really take the taking like the, the the crowd noise, but like I mean, for penalties and stuff, do you, do you actually start to take that in? Do you know what I mean? Like I was going to say, do you ever I, feel I, like hear the crowd do. or not? You must do. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think you hear them, but I just I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's it's such a weird feeling, such a strange feeling having a penalty. Honestly, I mean, I I don't I don't get. I wouldn't say I'm the type of person who gets nervous. Like walking out in front of, in a playoff final as captain in front of 85, whatever it was, thousand. I didn't. I didn't feel nervous doing that. But I reckon mm. if I had a penalty kick in front of 500 people in a preseason friendly, I'd feel a bit jittery. And it's mad, that isn't it? I don't know what it is yeah. about a penalty. Like it's it's crazy, but yeah. Just want to go back to something you mentioned earlier about uh, when David Wagner came in and the the stuff he was able to put together. It actually just brought back some memories of a previous pod that we did. We had Dean Whitehead on, and he was uh, he was talking about that. And uh, Johnny, you might remember this a bit better than me. It was like a team building exercise. Like I don't know, was it involved in like rafting or Austria? Kayak yeah, or yeah. Uh, no, yeah. Sweden. Yeah, yeah. No, Sweden. Sorry, no, it was Sweden. So Austria, we used to do Austria every pre-season, but the first pre-season that David had, he took us to Sweden. And again, I'm sure Dean's told you all the the, the details of it. It was horrendous. <laughs> Honestly, it was horrendous. And I bet if you ask David Wagner to this day, um, he would say the reason we got promoted was because of that trip. Um, and to be fair to him, he's, he's probably right because it was it was five days... Uh, in in a sweet in a Sweden in a Swedish, um, I want to say desert. It, it felt like a desert. That's what it was like. We literally went to the middle of this like forest, and we were all we got put in pairs, and we had to go uh, in a kayak around these islands, if you like, in Sweden. Mm-hmm. So we'd we'd kayak to one island. No phones, no f- no sort of food, no restaurants, no meals, no nothing. We literally had a bucket, and inside the bucket you had a raincoat. You had um, a, a water bottle. You had a pair of trainers. It was the bare minimum you can imagine. So we get on this on this kayak. We kayak to um, an island, probably three four hours on a kayak. We pitch up on the on the island, do a tent, stay in the tent overnight. Wake up the next morning, back in the kayak, three hours to another island, 
and we'd done this for five days. It was horrendous. Honestly. It's only football that you kind of do with these type of team building exercises. I've never like, known that like... before. I'll be honest, honest to God. I've never, <laughs> I've never known that before in my entire life. We, I remember we got on the bus. So we got the plane. Um, we got told to report for a day of, of pre-season and it was early. And I'm thinking to myself, that's a bit early that. But I understood it. It was his first pre-season. I thought he wants to hit the ground running, no problem. So we get there on pre-season first day and we're thinking like it's going to be a bit of testing, you know, like you normally do, you do a bit of testing. And we get there and the fitness coach says, um, said to the fitness coach, what's the score today then? He said, we're getting the train to Manchester Airport. So I'm thinking, right, okay, where are we going? We're going to the airport, where are we flying to? He said, we're going to Sweden. So I says, all right, okay. He said, I've got my boots. He said, you don't need your boots. So I said, all right, okay. He said, um, so I'm looking around at the stuff, you know, getting packed by the kit man. So I'm thinking, where's the balls? He said, no, you're not taking any balls. <laughs> so I'm thinking, what's going on here? <laughs> so I said, so what do we need then? He said, nothing, just bring yourself. Bring myself. So I was like, right, okay. Any clothes? No, no, you don't need any. Right, okay. So we get on this flight Stop. thinking, all the stuff must be out there already. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It must be. Sounds so very get, sketchy we, otherwise. So, you know what so I mean? we, land, we land in, so everyone's sort of thinking, what's going on here? So we land in Sweden. We get on the bus. And on the bus, the, the fitness coach comes around and he says, um, put your phones in this basket. Something like that. Why? He says, you, you, you're not going to need them. So I was like, oh, right, okay. I thought like it might have been a night thing. Do you know what I mean? We didn't have our phones for five days. That, that was it. Yeah, Literally, no phones for five days, just, honestly. Just, that, and you, that was the trip. I hope he told your family. Do you know what I mean? Like, imagine that like you've not. Oh, that was no. So before the trip, <laughs> you put you, you come in at the end, of, maybe the end of last se- the end of the season before or something. You write down contact details, next ah, of okay. kin, all this sort yeah. of stuff, emergency number. Little did we know that the following pre-season, we were ditching our phones, and that that was it. No contact to anyone for five days. <sighs> it was tough, honestly. It was it was like like I'm a celebrity getting me out of here. That 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 that, that, that was how I can describe it. That what it was like, honestly. <laughs> Did it help in terms of like I don't know showing the the character of some of the players? Oh, listen, I guess, for, for, well, this is it, and this is why he done it. It was a team bonding trip, and on the day of the final, um, we were in the hotel before, and we had a meeting before we left for the hotel, and they recorded. There was a fellow who come with us, and he recorded us on this trip. And at the time, you know, when you sort, you don't even really pay attention. Um, but he recorded it as all and before the final it was almost like this is what I'm saying about Wagner being sort of genius he he recorded that pre-season and he showed it to us the day of the game before we played in the final so we're all sat there in the team meeting and uh, on the big screen and meeting he, he says right this is the team today you know blah 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 does the tactics all this sort of stuff and then a vid- he said I just want to show you a video and a five minute video comes up on the screen of all the stuff that we've done in Austria in Sweden so it's got us doing the kayaking, it's got us building the tents, it's got us eating like uh, fish from the lake, all stuff like that, literally. Uh, a flashback of, of, of what we've done in Austria. So it's, I keep saying Austria, in Sweden. So yeah, it, it was brilliant. It just all, it all just fell into place and, and it's almost like it was written, you know, for us to win our penalties in the end because of what how, how the season went. Obviously, going back to that game, you, you spoke about having all the photos of like leading the team out and you know, I mean, that and being made club captain for obviously the return to the Premier League, that must be a source of pride looking back on it. Yeah, absolutely. Again, after after being promoted uh, in the way we did as captain, you almost feel like you've, you know, you've sort of not reached your pinnacle, but you've sort of, you've, you've got to a real, real high in your career. Um, and then when the manager uh, pulled me pre-season and said, listen, I want you to be the, the permanent club captain, uh, the first season back in the Premier League and however many years it's been. Um, well, I mean, what what a feeling that was. What an unbelievable sense of sort of pride and um, that, that just just everything. That, that you, you look back at your career and you sort of think like, you know, all the hard work that you've done and, and now you've reached this sort of moment because, listen, it's every, what I think it's every single player's, you know, dream to, to, to play in the Premier League. It certainly was mine when I was a young boy um, to, to, always, to always play in the Premier League. Um, so to actually do that, and then to be to be made club captain as well of doing that, unbelievable feeling. It must have been hard to leave Huddersfield then, um, and and go to Stoke. But I think you you mentioned earlier you're always kind of looking when you 
and, and being level headed when you get that contract and thinking what comes next, did that kind of play a part into it? I guess. Yeah. So it, we had we were very fortunate. We were very lucky. Well, not we weren't lucky. We fully deserved it. That lucky is the wrong word. We were. Um, we done well in the first season in the Premier League. We done very well. We we punched above our weight like you couldn't believe, um, and we fully deserved to stay up. But that second season was tough. Really, really tough the second season. We ended up finishing bottom of the league. Uh, didn't get a lot of points. Uh, I got injured uh, during that season. I'd done my hamstrings. So I was out for a few months. It, it was just a, it was very stop-start season for me personally. When I come back, I didn't get in the team as much as I'd have liked. Um, and towards the end of the season, my contract was, um, I think I had a year left, if I remember rightly. Um, and I just had the feeling that um, I, I didn't, I wasn't as valuable as I, as I previous was, previously was. Um wasn't playing every week. Um, you know, the manager had changed. David Wagner had left. A new manager had come in. There was just a bit of uncertainty around the club at the time. Uh, and obviously, we finished bottom. So, there was a little bit of a... I don't know. I just feel like the previous three, two or three years, the club was on such a high. And it just felt like, to me, it was just sort of on the decline a little bit. Um, I didn't have any intention of leaving. I, I genuinely didn't. I loved loved every single minute of being at Huddersfield. And um, I was I was happy to stay there. However, Stoke shown a bit of interest. Um, they'd spent a lot of money. It was a club that I knew that were desperate to get back in the Premier League. Um, and when they come in for me, I just couldn't say no. I just couldn't. Um, you know, it, it ticked a lot of boxes for me in terms of the expectation, in terms of their ambition. Um, it was just, it was just a great fit and one that again, I, I don't, I don't regret moving in, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I had three years there. I think I've, looking back at it now, you say it was a it was a big disappointment in terms of how it went the three years. But again, I certainly don't regret it, and I, and I don't hold any uh, any any regret from moving. Any uh, personal highlights from from your time at Stoke? Personal highlights. I mean, listen, I played over a hundred games for them. Could you class that as a personal highlight? I think in terms of the three years that we were there. Um, I played consistently. I think I'd done all right on the whole, but in terms of team. Team wise, I think we definitely underachieved. It was such an underachieve for the for the group of players that we had, and the money that was spent. I think we finished fifteenth, sixteenth, and fifth. It was somewhere around them, them that that position. And and for for a club the size of Stoke, and for for the team that we had, I think it was definitely an underachievement. Definitely. Well, obviously uh, things moved up from there, and you came came to Borough. Um, how was it the um, the move to Borough came about then? Uh, so my time finished at Stoke. Um, it was a summer, uh, a couple of years ago now. I, f- I finished at Stoke. Didn't really have any idea what was next. Um, I was quite happy to leave Stoke and 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 have a few weeks to just sort of let it digest a little bit. Um, in terms of what was next, you know, sat down with with my wife and my agent, and you know, weighed up what we thought would be a good sort of move, where we see where I see myself. Um, and to be totally honest with you. I, you know, a few weeks went by and there wasn't much happening. That, in all honesty, there wasn't a lot happening. I had a few offers, ones that weren't really, I wasn't really looking at and thinking, you know, I really fancy that. I had a few offers abroad that I've never been interested in, really. Uh, a couple of offers in England. Um, but again, I was sort of um and ah and there wasn't really anything that I thought, you know what, I really fancy that. Um, and then I, I had Chris Wilder on the phone. Chris, I've known Chris. I've known Chris a long time. Um, he rang me and he just said to me, "Listen, come up and train with us." And I sort of thought, Do you know what? It's it's a long way to come to train. Um, you know, I was sort of saying, "What? What? How, how's it going to sort of pan out?" I'd love to come. I'd love to play for you. Uh, brilliant club, big club. You know, want to help you sort of achieve what you want to achieve, all that sort of stuff. And he just said to me, "Listen, I know what you're about. Come up and train. Um, you know, I'd love to have you around. You're you're a voice. You're a leader." And just take it from there, um, and I and I did, and I, and I and I did, and I just thought, you know what, I want to commit to it. I'm going to come up here. I'll, I'll spend the preseason up here, um, and it just worked out in the end that I got offered the contract, you know. And I'm very thankful for the club for and and for the manager at the time for allowing me to do that, um, and it sort of just went from there, really. What's it like to work under Chris Wilder? Because we we had Matt Crooks on a couple of weeks ago, and he was so complimentary of, of Chris as well. And I think it was during a time as well where it was like. Chris was like tipped to move to either uh, to Bo- uh, to Burnley or to, to Bournemouth at that time as well. But like, what was it like to, to work under him? 
Uh, I, I, I got on well with Chris. Um, you know, ve- very grateful and thankful for the opportunity that he, he, he didn't need to bring me to the club. Obviously, like I said, I knew him beforehand, but he didn't need to ring me and bring me in. Uh, he didn't need to fight my corner to get a contract. I, I got a lot of respect for Chris and I think he's a brilliant, brilliant coach, brilliant manager. Um, it's a shame, obviously, it didn't work out at, at Middlesbrough uh, how how it did. But I'm, I'm I'm I fully believe that he's a he's a, he's, a, he's a great manager and he's and he was great to me. And I, I feel like you can only judge people on how they are to you as individuals. And, and Chris was always good as gold with me. Um, as I say, brought me in. Um, you know, was constantly sort of in my ear telling me, you know, this, this, and that. And listen, I I I understood the role that I was brought in to do with with Chris you know we sat down and had numerous conversations and he he was adamant he wanted me in the door he knew that I wasn't going to be a, a first team starter in his eyes you know he, the way he played and the way he set up it was always going to be sort of Izzy Jones on that sort of position and he made that clear to me and I knew that and understood that um, you know it was difficult I'll be honest with you I, 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 I knew I was always going to be sort of competing with Izzy and he was the first choice but I found it hard you know in the 11 games that he had at the start of that season I think only played in one of them um, in a league and I found it difficult you know it's it's always difficult being on the bench and not being involved in the first team and um, always maintain my standards I've done that because of the respect I have for Chris and that's just how who I am as a person in terms of always you know wanting the lads to do well and always being a voice and always sort of trying to drive the team on and, and help them as best as I can but it was hard um, not being involved in the team as much as I'd like for sure yeah, you talk highly of Chris Wilder. Obviously, he played a big part bringing you in. What was it like after he left so soon? I believe he left in the October. Um, what was it like for you as a player during that time? And did you feel like you had to prove yourself all over again after he left? It, so it was difficult when he left because, first and foremost, like I've just said, I, I wanted to play. I mean, he he brought me to the club. He fought my corner to to get me into the club. He wanted me at the club. And I feel like I never actually got the chance to play under him. I think, I, I, like I say, I played one game under Chris. Um, and that that was a shame because I always, you know, from the minute he showed an interest in me and bringing me in, you almost feel like you want to sort of repay that sort of you know that faith if you like. Um, so that was that was a that was a big shame that I didn't play under Chris as uh, more than I did. Um, I mean, little did I know that that when Chris left, I was going to end up playing as much as I did for under under the new manager. So when you say about trying to impress again, I think that's always the case. I mean, I'm, I'm 31 years of age now, and I still feel like I've I've always got to still impress. I don't think, going back to what I said before, the job's never done. Um, and I certainly don't feel that now. I mean, at some point when I get back fit again now, I'll feel like when I'm training again, I'll still need to impress the manager. That's just who I am as a person and, and how I sort of, how I deal with things. Um, you know, even though I've played under the manager and, you know, we had a good season last season, I certainly don't think that that means that all of a sudden I'm just going to come back into the team and play. Far from it. Um, you know, there's always a job to be done and, Make no mistake, when, when I'm back on the grass, I'll be, I'll be doing my utmost to impress the manager for sure. Yeah, you talk of Michael Carrick um, and how you played almost every minute under him prior to your injury. I mean, we all absolutely love Michael Carrick as fans. We think he's absolutely fantastic. Um, what is it like to work under Michael Carrick? Because he comes across as such a calm, level-headed kind of manager. What is he like to work under? He's exactly that. I think everything you see from from the outside, from you guys watching him probably on the side and listening to him in his press conferences and how he is as a person, he's exactly that. He's he's been he's been brilliant for me. Um, one thing he one thing he's done since he's he's been at the club is he's sort of give me um, not a role but not a responsibility. More like he's allowed me to to be one of the one of the voices and a leader in the group. And he's always sort of asking questions and bouncing things off. And you know he's he's, he's he lets he lets the senior lads be interactive in terms of meetings and stuff like that, and I I love that sort of stuff. I I sort of feel that's where I'm at, I'm at my best when when I can be vocal and when I can um, be myself and and sort of you know ask questions and this and that and and, and just lean on them really. And and one thing that that the manager and and certainly Woody Danksy Grant all the staff that have been great at is they've allowed me to sort of do that and lean on them and ask questions and. Um, and learn from them and, and they're such good people to learn from you know all, all of them really are only fresh out the game they've all been players in, in the same position as me and and, and that, that's such a good sort of thing to have and, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be in and around them uh, every day Yeah the first season under Michael Carrick was a really really successful one obviously and a really exciting one for everybody 
What would you say is the difference or differences between the Borough team of last season and the Borough team of this season? Um, I think this season has been um, different to last season because of a lot of um, incomings and outgoings. I think last season was a lot more... um, we, We were quite consistent last season I feel with how we were whereas this season has been a little bit difficult because of injuries being one I think the amount of injuries we've had this season has been it's the most I've, I've ever experienced in a, in a football club personally um, and that plays a big part I don't think I think it's quite easy for, for, for people on the outside to look and think oh there's a few injuries but it does it does hamper you in terms of how you are consistently in terms of what you're trying to do you know, different personnel, different shapes, all these things you got to take into account, that sort of stuff. Um, I think the summer window, there was naturally, there was a lot of people who left because of loans. Um, you know, we sold a few people. So we obviously have to bring people in. So, and that can take time. Thing, things things don't just work at the drop of a hat. They, they just don't, you know, it, it, it takes time to, some people um, can bed in a little bit, take a little bit longer to bed in than others. Some people can hit the ground running straight away. Everyone's different. Um, I mean, I certainly don't think I look at where we are now as a team and as a squad and where we are in the league and how, how I look back on this season. And I, I think this season we've done great. I really do. Um, considering the injuries we've had and the lack of probably consistency that we've had in terms of having players available to choose from. You know, it's not been it's not easy when um, you have a player coming into form and playing well and then all of a sudden he gets injured and he's out for three months. It's not easy to deal with that, and I think on the whole, how we've how we've dealt with it, certainly the manager in terms of galvanising the lads and keeping them upbeat and keeping them sort of resolute throughout the season, um, I, I think I think everyone's done great. Yeah, I think we all echo that. I think we speak for a lot of Borough fans. We, you know, what what we've managed to achieve this season, given all the injuries, has been pretty impressive, and we're all very excited to hopefully see what a fully fit Borough team will be doing next season. But in terms of the next 12 months, obviously 12 months left on, on your deal, what are your personal ambitions for next season at the club? Um, right now, I mean, I don't look too far ahead. In the few, that's one thing the manager said to me, actually, when I first got injured. Um, a very good bit of advice, actually. I remember he called me a couple of days after I got injured and just said, listen, he said, the best bit of advice I can give you is don't look too far ahead. He said, do small milestones. He said, that way they're a lot more achievable, you know, in terms of your milestones that you're doing. Instead of saying, right, I want to be fit on that day next year or whatever, or I want to, in seven months, I want to be able to do that. He said, just do a milestone at a time. And to be fair, that's what I've sort of been doing. Um, You know, he he was sort of saying, do it every, I don't know, every month you want to be there, every month you want to be there. So from a personal point of view, I, I just, I just need to get back fit. I need to get back on the grass. I've missed it enormously. Uh, the day-to-day runnings of, of being a player and being on the grass and training and travelling to games and all that sort of stuff. So my immediate ambition and goal is to just get back with the lads and get to a level where uh, I can be considered to to to, to play again. Because um, at the minute, I, I feel like I've missed that so, so much. I've got a few questions now on, uh, on something you've, you've touched on a couple of times regarding kind of like leadership within a team. Um, really interested in this subject and I think we had Matt Crooks on uh, last month or the month before and I think he mentioned um, one of the sort of downsides of this season was not having the likes of yourself and, and Daryl Lenahan on the pitch um, to kind of help in those moments where you need a little bit of leadership. How important do you believe a kind of core leadership group or you know a leader in a, a football team is on the pitch generally, I know you can kind of still contribute in in meetings and stuff, but in that ninety minutes. So, so I think, I mean, it's very nice, crook you to say that. Is that, is that what you said? Is he? Um, yeah, at least so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was singing your praises, so. you know, <laughs> singing your praises. <laughs> no, so I mean, I look, I look at our squad now, and there's there's a lot of leaders in different ways, and and that's absolutely fine. Everyone's a leader in their own way. I I, I always think that I always see that. If, if it means me being vocal and me being loud and me um, being that type of person that, that means I'm a leader, then that's fine, no problem. I look at, our, I look at the captain, uh, Johnny. He is a leader in every way you can imagine. The way he looks after himself, the way he conducts himself, the way he plays on the pitch, 
one thing Johnny isn't is he's not a shelter. So in that respect, I'm probably polar opposite to Johnny because I shout a lot. I'm in the changing room before the games and I'm shouting. I'm in the changing room at half time and I'm, I'm encouraging. I'm at the change full time and I'm whatever, whatever it is. I'm just a loud person. That's just how I am. And Dara is very similar to me in that respect. Um, whereas Johnny is probably not. He leads in other ways, and that's what I'm saying about everyone's a leader in their own in their own way. Um, and I think if you've got a good blend and a good balance of that in a changing room, then that's ultimately where you get your success. I think it's so important to have them them type of characters, though. Um, you know, because I've been in changing rooms over the years that haven't had them, and I've also been in changing rooms that have got them in abundance. Um, and I, I'm again speaking from my own experience. The changing rooms that have had that in abundance have always been the ones that have not necessarily done well in terms of. Um, league. I look at Stoke. I go back to Stoke as an example again. So in that changing room at Stoke, we had a lot of leaders who were very vocal. We had some big personalities, um, but we, we for whatever reason it just didn't work. What that was, I don't know. But it certainly helped us in the bad times when we had them bad times. Them leaders in the group, they sort of were the ones we we, we do, that pulled us through. Um, so I, I certainly think there's there's. There's, a, there's definitely a big place for 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 the for them types of players and characters who um, who like to sort of lead for sure. I just want to go back to something you mentioned a bit earlier on as well. Uh, you said when Chris Wilder rang you, he kind of said he, he knows what you're all about in terms of that, you know, being quite vocal and uh, and stuff in the dressing room. Um, Kind of how how did that develop? I, I suppose um, obviously it was mentioned here on that call, but when it comes time to to sign in the deal, does he kind of say to you like what he expects from you from from the season? I suppose um, no, I think again I, I, I was lucky because I, I knew Chris beforehand and he he knew what what I was as a person and how I am and who I am really. So he, he didn't really have to sell anything to me. He didn't really tell me what he expected from me. I think he sort of knew. Uh, what what he knew what my qualities were in terms of whether that was on the pitch or off the pitch or both or whatever it was. So when when I come to sign, um, he just he, he didn't say a lot. He didn't need to say a lot. I knew I knew what he wanted. I knew what I could offer, and that's where it just sort of went from. Really, there was no sit down like you know I expect you to do this. I want you to do that. I think he sort of knew what what I could bring, and he just sort of let me just. Do what do what I normally do. Um, again, I just I just touch on. I was just unfortunate that I didn't really play as much under him as I would have liked to. You mentioned earlier you think everyone can be leaders, kind of in their own way, and and not necessarily in the the vocal part of it, but you know other ways they conduct themselves. Um, you tend to see captains going to kind of more experienced players a lot of the time, but we've had uh, Rav van den Berg and Hayden Hackney both captains at points this season. I suppose, kind of what, what do you make of, of that sort of decision, I, su- I suppose, um, to, to make them captains? Do they just kind of show it, or has, that, um, has the leadership experience kind of developed over the season for them both, I, I suppose? Well, again, like I just said before, I think everyone can be a leader in their own right. I mean, one thing I would say about Hayden and Rav um, is, again, they're not necessarily probably cut from the same cloth as perhaps me and Dara in terms of vocal. You know, they're not. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have them down as shouters, but there's nothing wrong with that. They certainly, you, I don't think you have to be. I can go back to what you said about Johnny there. Um, Johnny, Johnny's a brilliant, brilliant captain, um, but he, he, he doesn't. He doesn't shout. He's not a shouter. That's just him. So Hayden and Rav, just because they have the armband on, I don't think they need to shout. It's not necessarily something you have to do when you're the captain. Um, I think a lot of time, you know, you lead by example on the pitch. Um, and I certainly think, certainly this year, definitely last year with regards to Hayden, um, you know, they, they, they've, both done, they've both done great this year. Um, I've not played with Hayden as much or Rav this much this year because of my injury but I know from last year, last season the way the way Hayden sort of transitioned from from being um an academy player to a to a fully fully fledged first team player um he's taken it so so well um I can't speak highly enough of how, of how well he's of how well he's done in terms of that transition and um, it's not easy 
it's not easy at all to to to, to come from academy to, to going straight into a first team and playing as much as he did last season. But the way he handled it and, and his performances um that he produced last year, they were they were absolutely fantastic. And uh, he's a he's a great kid as well. I, I sit next to him in the changing room. Really, really good lad. Um I get on really well with him. His feet are very firmly on the ground, but he knows that um you know the sky's the limit for him because he's a he's a top top player. Yeah, we're gonna to come to like towards like the close end of the, of the pod. We've got like four or five questions to to ask you um, now, um, and one of them is around like advice. And you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but from what Matt Carrick was saying here, um, and, and I want to ask, what's the best piece of advice you've had from like either a coach, player, family member, or mate? Um, just like if for your career. Um, do you know what? There's, I, I won't be able to. There's been that many. I've had that many coaches over my career. That have all give me different pieces of advice. Um, some very, very good, some not so good. Um, but I mean, one thing that probably I'll, almost everyone, I'm sure, I'm sure the manager now, when he first come in, would have said the same thing. I'm pretty, I'm pretty adamant he did. Is is it's a short career, uh, and I think I see that more now that I'm getting a little bit older. That you know, it doesn't last forever, and I think there's definitely a period in your career. I had it. I think it was probably the season we got promoted where you almost feel like you're invincible. You know, you've reached that sort of mm. level of, of, you know, the Premier League and everything that it brings and you feel like you're at the top of your game and that it's just going to last forever. You know, the the, mm. the going to Anfield and the going to the Emirates and all that sort of stuff. And you think, this is like, what an unbelievable feeling this is now. And you feel like it's just, that's it now. You're in this bubble yeah. almost of like um, the Premier League. And, and then when you get a little bit older, you think, God, that, that it's it's gone now. It's happened, and it does make you realise that it is such a short career, um, and you've got to enjoy the highs when when, when you have them, um, and you're going to get the lows, and 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 that's just it, and it's part and parcel of the journey and, and the career. And I think that that bit of advice is probably the best that you've had. I've had, sorry, um, because it's so true. You know, it is such a short career, and and it and it and it just goes like that, and you've got to make the most of it. Yeah, well, my next question is, what's next, uh, Tommy Smith? So, like, uh, obviously, the footballing career, you know, like, it's going to end at, at some point. Um, but what's going to be next? Are you going to go into, like, is it, like, management? Is it it's, TV work? You know is it just such, completely get out of the horrible, game? It's such a horrible question, and I get asked it all the time. And yeah. I hate answering it because, again, like, it's something that you don't want to think about. You, it's all it's yeah. all I've known is football and playing, and especially with with, with me being injured now, I have had a lot of time to think about it and I still mm. don't like talking about it. You know, I, I genuinely, I genuinely thought I've been sat down with the manager, uh, my wife, my agent, my mum and dad and sort of, you know, what are you going to do next now? And, da, 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 da. and I'm just like, I don't mm. really want to talk about it. I just want to get fit. I want to get back playing again. But I understand at some point, you know, it, it's going to come to an end uh, whenever that is, whether that's in a year, two years, three years, four years, who knows? I don't know. But in terms of, What's next? Um, I want to stay in football. Of course I do. Uh, yeah. I'm doing my coaching badges at the minute. Uh, I've done a little bit of TV work recently, which I really enjoy. Obviously doing this with you guys. Love doing all this type of stuff. Um, so who knows? I, I, I'm, I'm keeping my options open in that respect, but I'd love to stay in football because I just think it, it just gives just gives so much joy and, and enjoyment and, and, and life to you. And, you know, and, I'm very, very grateful and thankful for the for the opportunities that I've had in in football over the last uh, eleven years of my professional career, and you know I want that to continue in whatever whatever way, shape, or form that is. Yeah, and like just from like from us speaking, I've only spoke for about an hour, but like I, I I just get like the feeling that you'd be such a good coach to work under. Like I think for for me, like it's like not that vocal leadership. I think like the EQ is amazing. Like. I feel like you could, you would just be such a good coach to work under. I mean, you could be te- you could be technically horrendous, but I'd still run through a brick wall for you. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? I might, you know then, what? I've, I've done all right on me on me coaching badges recently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's to be fair I'm not one player yet. you've been playing long enough I hope so um, but uh, I was going to say like the last two questions I got for you uh, one is what's the most unusual or interesting pre-match ritual or superstition you've ever seen a teammate have it's a tough one isn't it <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm just trying to think off the top of my head there's not 
There's not many. I'm sure, do you know, if I'd, if I'd sit here and think about it, there probably is some. I mean, we had the German fella at Huddersfield. And I'm not going to name him. And he probably won't ever watch this pod. So he, he won't even know that I'm talking about him. But if he did listen, he'd know it was him straight away. He was a German fellow the day before a game, he always used to get in the shower, right? With a, you know, a bick, you know, a razor. Yeah. A bick and he razor. used to bick his whole body. <laughs> his whole body. What? Get on that. Everything. Day before a game, yeah. Day before a game. What? Full it. I've so, just used to, I've so just many used questions. To, just used to be in the shower with a, with a bick. He used to walk in with a shower gel in one hand and a bick. You know what I mean, don't you? You know the razor. Yeah, yeah, bick razor. Yeah, yeah, like a bick th- razor. Two or three blades. He, yeah. he just used to go over his, I'm talking arms. Chest, legs, the full it used to bit his whole body. It's like a new baby. baby. I don't know whether or not he thought he was like, um, it made him quicker, more streamlined. <laughs> I don't know why. Aerodynamics. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I, well, yeah that's, what he, that's what he used to do, yeah. Um, Shaved half a second off. Fuck, well, that was it, yeah. And he didn't get, he didn't get any quicker either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there you go, there's an unusual one for you. That is absolutely batshit. Um, I've never heard anything like that, to be honest. Never. Like it's mm. A big? Germans, mate. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, probably. I mean, that is very... I ne- when, I, when, you, when I asked that question, I never, ever would have imagined that response. Well, when you asked it, I was thinking, and yeah. I don't even know why it comes come into my head. I don't even know why. And I bet there's some even probably weirder ones than that, if I actually thought about it. But uh, that one just comes to my head for some reason. I don't know why. I mean, you can't forget it, to be honest. Like, it's that mm. like random, isn't it? Um, mm. The last question I got for you, and you've alluded, it, alluded to it a little bit, but I was going to ask you, what is your favourite moment in football? Um, well, yeah, stating the obvious, that one. I mean, I've, I've got a lot. I've, I'm very, I keep saying it, I'm very, very fortunate to have, to have um, experienced some of the things that I've experienced. I mean, yeah, going back to that, that season itself, the one that we got promoted in with Huddersfield was was everything. It was like a whirlwind. Everything was just like we we were we were a good side, and I, I was I was I had I, that was when I played some of my best football that year. Um, you know, I ended up getting a team of the year and um, goals and assists and all that sort of stuff. And then to be captain, it was just an unbelievable year. So that that season on the whole was unbelievable. Um, my Premier League debut away at Palace was an unbelievable moment because we won three nil. Um, yeah, staying up, we stayed up that season at Stamford Bridge. We went to Stamford Bridge and we ended up drawing the game. I think with about three or three or four games to go, we needed a point out of the last few games and we we drew at Stamford Bridge and got and and stayed up. That was an unbelievable night. Um, yeah, lo- so many so many good good moments in my career and so fortunate um, to to have experienced them. You know, we, we were obviously unlucky last year with the semi-final. Getting to the playoffs with Middlesbrough in the first season was an unbelievable achievement. Um, you know, there's still every chance that we could potentially do it this year. But listen, the club, the club's in good hands, you know, with the manager and the squad that we've got and, and what have you. So if it's not going to be this year, I'm sure we'll be looking at next year. And, and, and you know, we've got a very, very good group of players, very good group of staff. Um, so, yeah, all things considered, I, I, th- I think we've, we've had a great season and, the only way is up, definitely. Absolutely. Tommy, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, today. Honestly, I really appreciate your time as well and taking time out to speak to us. Um, and for the listeners as well, if you like this podcast, do uh, don't forget to subscribe, like, uh, sub, and do all the fun stuff, share the podcast, helps us get found and chatted and all that kind of uh, fun stuff. But for right now, uh, this has been the Bora Breakdown podcast and that was all your Tommy Smith chatter in a pod. Up the Bora.